Hi there. Welcome back again to the Ivory Tower Collections. I have uh, featured this lovely device in a previous video where I was showing off some of its sound capabilities and described a little bit uh, about it. In this video, or actually series of videos, I'm going to go into more detail about some specific uses and functionality on how to use the Roland MT200 uh, sequencer and sound module. So let's talk a little bit about this box here. What is it, first of all? Well, the MT series of modules and uh, MIDI players from Roland were called that because they stood for Music Tutor. Specifically, they were designed for teaching people how to play music, how to play piano, things of that sort. They're primarily designed and marketed for those uses. So as a result, uh, these tend to get overlooked by the retro game players and people building retro machines with MIDI capabilities because they are more familiar with like the MT32 or the which by the way the MT32 did not mean uh, music tutor it stood for multi timbral uh, different different uh, terminology for that but anyway they tend to look for the MT32 or the SC55 SC88 things like that so a lot of times these MT200 and the 300 and the 80 and a few other devices they're overlooked but they really shouldn't be because they're really quite awesome in their capabilities. Although they are more limited, you can't uh, you can't edit some of the effects on the fly and things like that like you can with the larger scale modules or normal standalone modules. You can still do some things with these you can't do with those, which is where I'm getting to. So the MT200, it's uh, it came out in around the tail end of '93 and 1994. I'm not sure for how long it was on the market, but it did retail at the time for, if sources are to be believed, around $2,400. So that's $1993, $94. So they weren't cheap. They were very expensive. That would be expensive today, uh, and especially so 20, almost 30 years ago. So, so a lot of money. So basically, it is a general MIDI and GS standard capable module and MIDI playback device. In addition, it can do sequencing. And what that means is that if you have a separate MIDI keyboard or a controller attached, you can, using your keyboard or other device, you can play music and use this box to actually record your music in separate tracks. So it's kind of like a multi-track editor sequencer. And then using the disk drive, you can save your music for later playback or further editing or take it to a computer and use it with additional software for further modification. So yeah, quite a, quite a lot of use. Um, because it does have the GS SoundBank standard, it has over 300 total instruments and sounds in addition to 10 different drum sample sets. So it's quite versatile, it's got a lot in it. It's not MT32 compatible, although it does have the CM32 drum banks. So those can be accessed. So anyway, so the primary features on this machine are as follows. And we're gonna start with the front, of course. So the real standout features, of course, are the disk drive, this lovely little spinning encoder wheel, and the LCD display. So the disk drive, as I've said before, and I'll go into more detail on this later, is used for recording and for reading back music data off of the diskettes, which, and I go into more detail on it, it basically can read both uh, double density 720K diskettes as well as uh, 1.44 meg high density diskettes. And it stores the music format in two primary ways. Well, actually. When you record from the unit and save music from it to a diskette, it's recorded in a very specific format, which stands for like a Roland Sound Canvas file format. The files have RSC and RSD extensions and are not natively able to be read by MIDI playback programs. Uh, they can be read in a, in a IBM DOS computer, so the files are readable, they just, you just can't do anything with them but this machine can read those files natively because that's how it writes them. It can also read data that is in standard MIDI format on diskette or files that have the MID mid type extension. Uh, the encoder wheel here is called the alpha dial and it is used for making selections within the menu options displayed here in the LCD which is essentially a two row 20 by 2 or 40 character display. It's only monochromatic, so it's just black against this, this green uh, color, as you see here. 
Other buttons, of course, we have our power button down here, which turns the unit on and off. And we have a marker clear and the marker A and B buttons. And these kind of, at that end, the repeat button over here, all four of these kind of work together. They allow you to use the marker buttons to specify the beginning and end of a particular section of music you might be listening to. You can use the repeat button for it to repeat that section over and over and over and over and over. And then you use the marker clear button with those A and B buttons to remove any markers you have set on the song. You, of course, have a volume slider here which uh, works uh, very similar to like the volume slider on the Sega Genesis Model 1. It's just a rheostat, basically. Uh, we'll start with the bottom row here, because it's where there's larger buttons, I guess. We have a reset button, which is used to not only reset the module's current status back to default GS standard mode, um, basically back to its normal instrumentation, for the most part, but it also acts as a rewind for the beginning of song. So if you're listening to a song, you get so far into it, you decide you want to start it over, you just hit the reset button and it'll revert back to the very first measure. You have your stop, play, and record buttons. They work exactly as you would think. Stop will stop the current music you're listening to, play will play it, record will allow you to record music. You have these two buttons here with the double arrows. They have BWD and FWD. Well, they mean backwards and forwards or rewind and back or front to back or whatever you want to want to say. These are used for essentially advancing a song that you're listening to by one measure or back one measure depending on where you're at. The next door up above this is where you control the track listening and recording as well as if you want to specify count in measures and the metronome feature. So the way that that all works is when you're playing back some music most tracks, most MIDI tracks especially, will have data contained on all five tracks here. Tracks one, two, three, four, and the rhythm track marked with the R over here. So when you're playing back a piece of music, you can actually turn off selective tracks and mute or uh, silence those particular tracks. So you could just listen to just the rhythm as an example. And I'll go into more detail in a demonstration of the disk drive playback function for that. You also have the count in and metronome, and these are used primarily for recording music. The metronome is exactly what it sounds like. It'll play a constant metronome type beat over and over. The metronome and count in functions, by the way, are not recorded with the music, so you won't hear those if you're recording something and you're using their functionality. The count in is used to give you a two measure count in on whatever the current tempo is before the music starts. So again, when you're recording something, you hit the count in button, it'll go through and do two measures worth of the uh, beat before it will actually begin to record. So that gives you time to prepare and get ready to get started. We already talked about the encoder wheel known as the alpha dial. We also have these four buttons here, this blue one and a, uh, uh, like a right arrow, left arrow, and an enter key. And these are used primarily to select things within the LCD itself. The blue button is basically called the song button and that's exactly what it's for. So whenever you want to choose or select a specific song title that you want to listen to or edit, you hit the blue button to first move the cursor or the arrow that will appear next to your song. You use the alpha dial to change the song. And then you can use the right arrow here to go to the beat, which will allow you to adjust the beat of the measures. So, you know, either 4-4 time or 3-4 time, etc. The uh, left, or I'm sorry, the arrow pointing to the right, that's the left, this is the right, I had them backwards, I'm looking at them backwards on my screen, I apologize. This arrow here pointing to the right is for the tempo, and it's just that. You'll have a tempo, which almost all songs here, at least with this module, it starts off at 120 uh, beats per, per minute. So you would have it underneath tempo, and again, using the alpha dial, you can adjust your tempo speed. And then the enter key is a dual function, it acts as both transpose and enter. So, again, as an enter key, it will be used for confirming different selections. And if you're playing back music and you hit the same button, it's used to put it into transpose so that you can change the octave of the current song that uh, is being played or that you're editing and working on. You also have a little beat indicator up here that is both a green and red LED. So, let's say you're in 4-4 time, you'll see three greens and a red that will, be, that will uh, go in time with the music. So that's the bulk of the front panel here. There's also another panel on the MT200 up here that contains additional buttons. Here we go. Now all the buttons here at the top have two functions. Using the shift key marked here allows you to access 
the functions marked at the bottom portion of the buttons. It's actually in light blue, but I'm not sure how well that will show up in the camera. So the buttons are like this. You have the chain play and pause mark. So the chain play is the button you use to play music off the diskette in order. So if you don't want to just listen to one song, you use chain play and it'll go through and play all the music that's on a disc. Metro beat basically allows you to change the beat tone of the metronome, which was marked down here. Uh, there's really only two different options, so that doesn't get a lot of use. The sound and write buttons are used to select, in addition to effects, are used to uh, change the current sound tone that you're using or that's being generated through the module. You have the MIDI and disk button here, which is used for changing functionality of the MIDI ports, as well as um, accessing disk functions, which I will go into a separate uh, section of this video for the disk functions. We already talked about the shift key. In the edit section here, you got cut, copy, paste, play, stop. So cut and copy work similar as you would expect. If you hit cut, that allows you to cut a specific measure of song out. And it doesn't delete it, you're just cutting it. So you're removing it from where it currently exists, and then wherever you happen to paste it to is where it gets moved to. Whereas copy, on the other hand, will do exactly that. It'll make a copy of the current measure section you're working on, and then you can use paste to apply a copy of it elsewhere. So you have the original section that it came from, as well as another copy of it uh, elsewhere in the music. Play stop allows you to do just that, play and stop wherever you're at in the editing. Other functions below that, you have the quantize, you have the transpose, erase, and undo. Quantize is a function that allows the module to automatically adjust the note placements at uh, within the measures. So. For instance, you know, you're playing back music on an actual MIDI uh, keyboard and you didn't quite start right on the beat like you'd meant to. I mean, you correct it later on, but maybe that first note was just a little off or a few other notes are a little off beat. The quantize function can be used to adjust that. But the manual does warn that using the quantize button can give it a very artificial sound in that it, uh, it's, it's almost too perfect. So they do recommend a uh, generous, or not generous, but you know, be, be cautious with the use of the quantize button because in a lot of ways it removes the human effect or the human element of the sound. Transpose is exactly what it was before. You just change the current octave of whatever you're working on. You can erase a certain section of music you're working on. And then of course you have the lovely undo button. Save and save as work just as you would expect. If you just hit save, it basically saves the current song with the current same title and song number location on top of itself. And then save as will allow you to save it as a different song with a completely different title. So that's essentially what the top buttons are for. Now let's talk about the back. Here we're looking at the back of the MT200 Roland module. And I'll just briefly kind of go over what most of these inputs are or outputs. They're going to be pretty self-explanatory. Most Roland modules will feature some sort of a little plastic piece that hangs out like this. And this is actually kind of a retention device for locking the power cable into and looping it so that it can't be yanked out easily and uh, possibly come loose from the machine and possibly damage the power input port. Mine has actually got a little broken tab. It's funny, I see a lot of them like that uh, that are offered on auction sites. So I guess that's a pretty common issue. So they must have gotten yanked around or else that, uh, that wouldn't be the case. And, so it obviously did its job, but it's not required. But that's that's just what that's for, a little retention bracket for the power cord. You have the power input port itself, which on this particular module, it's actually marked pretty well. It says DCN 9 volts at uh, 1200 milliamps with a, um, a negative center tip polarity or outer positive polarity. Not all modules from Roland are marked that well. Some are, but not all. So let's talk about that. So the actual power module or power supply for this, and it even tells you use Roland ACB only um, or ACK adapters only. But you know, a lot of these modules, when you receive them on auctions, they won't have their original power supply anymore. And even if they did, it's, it's an old power supply. But there are two, well, there's two replacements I'm gonna show you. One is incredibly common and very inexpensive that you can use. The other one's more expensive, but it's an actual Roland replacement. So the first replacement supply is what I actually used for several weeks before I found a legitimate Roland replacement for this. And it is, ta-da, 
I don't know how well it'll show up on the camera. That is a Sega Genesis Model 1 power supply. Uh, which is the model 1602-1 in this case, but I think there was also just a 1601 or 1602 power supply. This meets the exact same specifications that this thing needs. It's exactly nine. Well, it's a nine volt output adapter at 1200 milliamps or 1.2 amps. Exact same replacement, and it even has the right connector plug with the correct polarity as well. So you can use a Sega Genesis Model One power supply on this particular module sequencer. I believe the 120, uh, MT120 is also the same, and I believe also the Roland MT32 sound module is the same. So a lot of the devices from Roland are kind of similar in their power requirements, and uh, again, a Sega Genesis Model 1 power supply will, will probably work in a pinch, but always verify with the device what its specific power requirements are, and especially the polarity as well, to make sure you don't damage the, uh, the unit. The second power supply to use, and this is a, a much better option, although it is more expensive, is this one right here. And I just got this one recently. This is an actual Roland power supply. It's not designed for this machine, of course. It's designed for other stuff, but it also meets the same power requirements. This specific supply is uh, a Roland and I had it here once before. It's really small, so I apologize. It's kind of difficult for me to see it. It's the PSB-1U. Again, that's PSB-1U. That's Papa Sierra Bravo-1U as in uniform. And this is really cool. It's got the nine volts we need, and it actually puts out two amps. So it actually puts out more current than this unit requires, but that's fine. It's never bad to get a higher current power supply. What's important is that the current meets the requirements. It can exceed, no problem. It needs to have the uh, same output voltage that's required. And especially important is the polarity. And as it turns out, this nice little adapter also has the same center negative tip polarity and it's the same plug type. So this is an excellent replacement power supply for these modules. And since it's made by Roland, you're keeping it all essentially within the family. Another good advantage with this power supply is that it is a more modern switching power supply. And unlike a wall wart, as we call it, like the Sega Genesis that plugs right into your adapter, this has a separate infinity type symbol, uh, two prong power cord in addition that actually plugs into the outlet. So it saves a little more space on your outlet when using it. It's because it's a switching power supply, it's more uh, energy efficient. And because it's supplying a more steady nine volts to the module itself, the regulators inside don't have to work as hard. So it doesn't get as hot and having to dissipate the extra heat as it would off of a, off of a more unregulated linear power supply like the Sega Genesis. So these run about, I think I picked this one up for around $30 shipped to my house. So, you know, you can get them used, get them new. I happen to get mine new. They're not always priced that, uh, that accordingly. I think on average they go for almost 40, but just check around and uh, it's a great, great replacement. And again, it's made by Roland. So I would assume it'll last a long time. Okay. Back to the rest of the ports. All of the output and slash input ports that are used here all use like the eighth inch size uh, plug connectors, which if you're not familiar with the way those look, they're like this. They're like the larger headphone type jacks like this, more for studio use. And this first port is for headphones. So obviously you don't have to plug it into actual speakers. You could just plug in a set of headphones and listen to everything that way. You have your audio output here with your right and left. If you're listening to or hooking it up into a monaural source like speakers, you know, you only have one speaker for instance, or one amplifier speaker, you use the left connection here for the mono. Uh, you have a metronome volume adjustment, and it is just that. This is to separately adjust the volume of the metronome function. And then these other three here are used with external pedals for controlling the expression of the current sound and, and things like that. And then we have our MIDI ports here. And specifically, it's important to know how these actually are to be used, especially with this particular module. The MT200 features a MIDI in and a MIDI out here, which is marked as MIDI in piano in parentheses. And these are kind of misleading, and I'll get to that. And then you have the MIDI auxiliary input and a throughput ports here. 
And these are the ones I primarily, well, these are the ones I would primarily use. So let's talk about their functions. The MIDI import or the MIDI in port is where your connection from your computer or from another MIDI device that you want to send data to this plugs in. So from your computer, you'll have a MIDI cable that will go into the MIDI in here. If you need to daisy chain another sound module, maybe an MT32 or an SC88 or whatever, then you would also have a MIDI cable that comes off the throughput port here into the MIDI in port of your other device. It allows you to daisy chain the devices. Now, doing so, if you want them to be used at the same time, usually requires that you have to specify different MIDI channels as an ID of the different devices. This doesn't really give you the ability to change an ID. So if you're gonna use it with another module, be, ad be advised that you're gonna either want to turn the volume off or remove the speaker source from this so that you don't hear this module at the same time as another module it, whenever you use the throughput. Because whatever goes into this is coming right back out of this. That's how that works. Now the piano side is a little different. Basically the MIDI in works very similar to what you get over here. So it's receiving instructions or MIDI data from another device or your computer. And then the MIDI out from here isn't a throughput. So what's coming in here isn't coming out of here. What comes out of here is specifically data from just the module itself, which could be unique, especially if you have your keyboard plugged into this and then you want to control something else or send other commands separately from that, you can do so here. However, I do not use these two ports because they are designed for a digital piano or specifically a MIDI piano controller. They basically are locked to just the grand piano sound on this module. Now, it's not the only sound that it plays, but basically it doesn't have the ability, if you're using the ins and output from this side, it doesn't really have the ability to play multi-channels all at once. So you're stuck with just one channel and it's usually a piano type sound. So I don't use these two ports. I use just primarily the auxiliary input port, which is what allows me to connect it from my computer and actually use this as a sound module in classic games. And that's what gives me all the tones and, and all the channels that I would be used to hearing. Last thing we have is a little switch over here that you use between, it's, it's marked as piano and it says external and internal, E-X-T, I-N-T. This is to determine which set of sounds you wanna hear. When you have it set to E-X-T or external, that means that the sounds that you'll actually hear being sent through the module will be the sounds from the MIDI device itself or the MIDI keyboard, not this, not the MT200. If you instead want to use the MT200 sounds, then you switch it to the internal side. So if you're gonna use this for computer games, uh, old computer games, you're gonna to wanna to connect your computer up to the MIDI in port and you need to make sure you have this switch here set to the internal sound source selector. And that pretty much covers the back-end options on the MT200. Okay, now I'm going to go over some of the functionality of the hidden diagnostics menu that's, that exists in these modules. Now, the way you access this will be different depending on the module type, so I'm only going to be covering how you access this menu on the MT200 itself. So here's how you do it. It requires three buttons to be depressed as you power on the unit. You have to hold down repeat, the song button and the play button. So I'm going to do that now. I'm going to use two fingers here to hold down the song and play buttons. I'm going to use my index finger here to hold down repeat and turn on the unit. Now you'll hold down the buttons until you see this show up in the display. Specifically, it is showing us the version number information. So I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit and uh, we'll go over the other functions as well. Here we are, we're zoomed in a little bit on the front panel controls and I have it in diagnostic mode. So I'm gonna briefly go through the different diagnostic options and describe them. So it starts off when you're first in diagnostic mode giving you your current firmware revision. Mine happens to be using version 2.01. If you use the forward and back buttons down here, they'll scroll through the different test options. But the reality is, is that several of the buttons are used throughout the different test options. So I'll go to, I'll hit the forward button and show you test two, which is to test the RAM and battery. If I hit the play button, that will actually activate that test. So let me go ahead and hit that now. You'll see that it says the battery is okay. 
and that the uh, SRAM is also okay, as well as the DRAM. So it looks like everything is good to go here. I'll go to the next test, which is for the clock. And I won't go into this right now, but this will basically show you what the current date and time is on the module. And you might be wondering, why do you even care? Well, for just normal module use, you wouldn't really care what the date and time is on this thing. But when you're saving your music that you create through the module and save it to diskette, you would because you'd want to make sure that it has the right date and timestamps. Oh, I changed all the options using the encoder. I apologize. Okay, so that's the clock. So four is for the sound ROM, and when you hit play, it just does a quick, uh, basically like a checksum on the sound ROM module, and just you know comes back okay, hopefully. Number five is for disks, or for checking the disk drive mechanism, and I will go into that in separate detail. You have the encoder test, which if I hit play, it's going to want you to move the encoder wheel one direction, and then back again for a full test completion. You have the expression test, and this really requires pedals to be plugged in, so I'm going to skip that for now. You have the uh, switch and socket test. Now this is a different switch. This is basically for switching or for checking the ports in the back side of things. So we're going to skip that for now as well. But basically it's, it's just that. It would have you push each of the buttons on the module as well as plug in devices in the back. Same thing with the MIDI test. It will have you plug in different cables and just verify that it receives or can see MIDI cables and data on each of the ports. We have the LED test, which is exactly what it sounds like. If I push play, it's going to ask me to push play or record. And the reason for that is because if I push play, it will light up all the green colored LEDs. If I push red, it will light up all the red colored LEDs. So I'll push play, and you'll see that each green LED will light up in succession, and then they're all there. When the test is complete, all of the green LEDs will remain lit. If I then push the record button, all of the red LEDs will light in succession. And then when that test is complete, they will remain lit as well. We have the LCD test, which when you activate this, it'll go through some different LCD patterns. So I've just pushed it. It says push the record switch. And there we are. So the first pattern is to light up all of the LCD segments. If I push record again, it will show a blank display. I push it again. Now it's showing me like a checkered board pattern, starting off with the even numbered segments. And then if I push it again, it'll do another checkerboard pattern showing the odd numbered segments. And then back to all again. So then on the metronome test, if I hit play, we will hear the metronome. It's enough of that. The sound test will allow you to listen to all 28 voices of the module to make sure that the full 28 note, 28 note polyphony is working properly. Now when you hit the play button on this particular test, it's going to start off with a single tone on just voice one as you can hear there. Using these uh, left and right arrow keys up here allow you to switch in that tone between the channels. So if I push the one here going towards the right, it shows sine right, which means sine wave on the right. Push this one on the left, it switches to sine left. If I use the enter key, it combines the sine wave on both channels. If you use the song button, it will actually scroll through the voices uh, one at a time automatically. You can also use the play and stop buttons to scroll between the voices independently if you want to. So I'll just use the play button here, or I'm sorry, the song button, and you can see that it scrolls through each voice playing the tone. Just like that. So obviously if there was an issue with the logics of the uh, voice playback of the module, you would hear uh, a distortion or you would hear nothing on a particular voice, but it passed on this test. 
We have the effect test, which is kind of cool. So when you hit play on this, you can scroll between the different effects you want to listen to. So we have the, uh, the chorus, and we have... <laughs> Okay, so let me go back on that. So it'll start with the chorus. You use the play and stop buttons to switch between the effects. You use the record button to actually play back the effect. So as you heard there on the chorus effect, I used the record button for that. And I don't know how well that shows, what, how well you can hear that. There you are. And then you have the hall effect, which will just play like a snare drum and you'll hear it to kind of like echo. And we have the delay effect. And then we have what I believe is the pedal sustain function showing you the delay of the pedals, which just plays a long tone. And then another one which plays the same thing but a shorter tone. And that's it. And that's the effect test. And then that takes us back to the last option in the menu, which is the setup. It's a firmware setup test. This one is cool because this is where you can go to reset the module back to factory default values. So if you have something in place and you're not sure, uh, you know, maybe you made an option somewhere you didn't mean to, then you can just go to this. You hit the play button and it'll ask you if you want to push load, which you use the record button to load factory defaults, or you can cancel by using the stop button. So I'll go ahead and hit the record button and it'll say load OK. And that's it. I've now loaded the factory default values. And that is the basics of the diagnostics. In the next few videos sections, uh, I'll go into more detail on the disk and some of the other options as well.